Uh, so the next one is by Dr. Charles White from the University of Maryland. It's a live lecture on the heart and pericardium. Well, I'm pleased to be here uh, for resident uh, boot camp, and I'm actually going to go slightly AWOL and talk not just about CT, uh, but also uh, MRI and a little bit of plain film with respect to the heart and pericardium. So when we look at uh, cardiac imaging techniques, these are the big three, but I think you should be aware that we also rely heavily on imaging techniques that are not primarily done in the context of radiology, at least not usually, perhaps nuclear medicine to some degree. So it's going to be chest radiograph, cardiac CT, and cardiac MRI. And as Mark Parker showed you earlier in the morning, uh, very nicely, uh, we can look at uh, cardiac anatomy from uh, a particular perspective, both PA and lateral, and um, the right atrium uh, is actually not labeled here, but uh, partly because it's off, it's hidden by the spine, but basically on the PA we do not see the right ventricle, we do see the right atrium usually, uh, we see the left-sided chambers, and on the lateral view, You'll notice the right ventricle, the left atrium, and left ventricle are visible, but we do not see the right atrium. So missing the right ventricle on the frontal and the right atrium on the lateral. Enlargement of the cardiac chambers, as in this case, will give you a clue to what might be the underlying diagnosis. And in this patient, there is enlargement of the left atrial appendage, and on the lateral view posteriorly, the left atrium is also enlarged. So this is left atrial enlargement, a finding uh, invariably associated with mitral valvular disease. One of the things that uh, Dr. Parker wasn't able to cover, uh, but I'll show here for, because I think it's, uh, obviously the talks are short, um, is cardiac calcifications. And this is a critical one that we see quite a lot, and particularly it is common in older women, and uh, this is mitral annular calcification. So it's often uh, circular or J-shaped, uh, projecting over the left heart, uh, and we see it all the time on ICU films. Le uh, another calcification that is at the edge of the left ventricle, hence left ventricle left ventricular calcification is usually an indication for pri of prior myocardial infarction. And so the localization of this is actually rather key uh, and indicates the patient had uh, the, a prior ischemic event and also if it's bulgy, often indicates the presence of a left ventricular aneurysm. On the other hand, if the calcification extends to the right side of the heart, perhaps in addition to the left side of the heart and anteriorly as well, then you might think of pericardial calcification, which often favors the grooves, the AV grooves, the right side of the heart, and perhaps the left side of the heart. So that would be a good way of distinguishing myocardial from pericardial calcification. And clinically, when one sees pericardial calcification, one should give, give some thought to the possibility that the patient has constrictive pericarditis. All right, so let's move to cardiac CT, and there are actually innumerable uh, indications for cardiac CT, and I've listed uh, several of these, and we'll go through each in turn, and then we'll talk about pericardial imaging, both with CT and MRI, because they're uh, complementary. So let's start with calcium scoring, and calcium scoring is generally done in asymptomatic patients. That's the best indication. It's generally used to direct preventive treatment. The scoring system that is used is automated and will register as calcification anything with the Hounsfield units greater than 130. The operator then selects the areas in the coronary arteries and that has to also be uh, separated from bones or mitral annulus uh, where you also get calcification. And then there's a scoring program which essentially summates the amount of calcification and it's, cal it's weighted based on Hounsfield unit and quantity. 
and that's a sigma function which can lead to a final score that uh, is often given as an Agustin score, which is an axial technique, a volumetric score, or a mass score. And so you'll get a number at the end which will be used to potentially uh, direct treatment. Now if we talk about coronary CTA, we're generally talking about a symptomatic patient. And um, you know, we'll look at a coronary CTA, of course, with, I think everybody's familiar with the chambers, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. And in order to do a coronary CTA, we're going to generally have to medicate the patient's uh, beta blockers, perhaps not in every patient, but particularly if the heart rate is fast or the patient isn't already on beta blockers, uh, we'll give the uh, beta blockers to slow the heart rate below ideally 65 beats per minute. Uh, nearly every patient who doesn't have a contraindication, we will give nitroglycerin, uh, and then we may use a split bolus in order to mute, as you can see in this case, the contrast in the right heart. And every uh, study, coronary CTA, will be ECG gated. We have a choice of gating. So classically, there's prospective, which is a lesser dose and therefore preferred. And the top graph here shows that. So the beam is only on for a particular, uh, a particular point in time. We have a step and shoot technique. Uh, and then the patient moves, uh, the, the gantry moves, and it's on again. And whereas a retrospective gating, the beam is on at fully on at all times, and we use a helical or spiral mode. We can mitigate that uh, perhaps with uh, some uh, down, uh, down placement of the beam, but uh, generally it's going to be a larger dose. And so we're going to prefer prospective gating um, both for CCTA, coronary CTA, and also for calcium scoring. A retrospective, if we cannot reduce the heart rate, uh, if there are arrhythmias, if the patient is large, or if we require the complete cardiac cycle, we'll use that. Now, what about the indications for coronary CTA versus stress imaging? Because these are the two big non-invasive modalities. In general, if you have a low likelihood, then uh, perhaps a, a calcium score could be done. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be decided by the age of the patient, younger and less obstructive coronary disease suspected would favor coronary CCTA coronary or CCTA, whereas the older patient with more obstructive disease would tend to move towards stress testing. And these are nice chest pain guidelines that came out uh, just in the last year. When we finish the coronary CTA, generally we'll, we'll look at them in axial images, uh, do off-axial uh, in, uh, interactive uh, looks as well, and then we will use MPR images to reconstruct in the plane of the coronaries. And we use what's called the CADRAD score. So we're all familiar with TIRADs, LIRADs, LUNGRADs, et cetera, et cetera. CADRADs, of course, deals with the obstructive level of the coronaries. And I've given you three examples here. CADRADs, one, where there's very little coronary disease. Where there's moderate coronary disease, 50 to 75, we call it CADRADs, three. And we have complete obstruction, that would be CADRADs, five. And there's a modification of CADRADs, actually, which is uh, in press or about to be in press right now. All right, other cardiac imaging. Coronary anomalies are very important. They occur in up to 1% of individuals. They can be a cause of angina, syncope, or death. And uh, after hokum, they are the second leading cause of cardiac death in young athletes. Catheterization is correct in only about 50% of cases. And we have benign and malignant varieties. So here's a, a malignant variety of the RCA. If it goes between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, that's consistent with a malignant variety. You'll notice that it arises from the left cusp uh, before it does that. So it's the wrong cusp going between the great vessels and that would be a bad outcome or a bad potential outcome, a malignant course. What about cardiac mass is another thing that we do cardiac CT for. And I've listed here the most common in order. Uh, mass would be thrombus, also lipomatous hypertrophy of the atrial septum. Uh, if we talk about tumors, uh, in general, it's going to be metastatic disease. If we talk about primary cardiac tumors, it's going to be a myxoma, generally an atrial, generally a left atrial myxoma. And if we talk about primary malignant tumors, it's going to be a sarcoma, often and angiosarcoma, but note that those are extremely rare. And on the right here, I have an example of the most common mass, which is a left, well, a, a thrombus, in this case, at the left ventricular apex. 
and the most common primary cardiac tumor, which is a myxoma, in this case, in the left atrium. And that typically attaches to the septum, as it does here. We can also see other things with cardiac CT. So this is a cardiac aneurysm, and generally uh, they're outpouchings of the left ventricle. We can actually perhaps show this in motion. And we can also see the volumetric reconstruction of that and a cath showing occlusion of the RCA, which is the etiology. We can separate left ventricular aneurysms from pseudoaneurysm. In my view, the best way is the size of the mouth. This is a wide mouth, and though its position is somewhat inferior, I would suggest this is a, a left ventricular aneurysm. Now, one other area that we can talk about, which is a very important and somewhat uh, difficult area, is congenital heart disease. Not all of this is difficult, and I'll show you one of the more common lesions. So this is a, a patient who has, uh, the finding is easily visible here, but probably better visible on the uh, reconstructed images. And uh, so this is a four-chamber reconstruction, and you can see there is a defect in the atrial septum. Uh, so this is a secundum-type atrial septal defect. This is the most common congenital heart disease in adults. VSD would be in children. All right, if we talk about cardiac MRI, talk about myocardial assessment, that's an area of real strength. And then if we look at the other things, pathology, morphology, there is overlap with cardiac CT and they're somewhat complementary. And congenital heart disease, uh, there is that, a real role for cardiac MRI, particularly in children, to reduce the radiation dose. With cardiac MRI, we're gonna generally rely on a CINE image or SSFP image, first pass perfusion, viability imaging, and there are other sequences uh, which I will maybe mention. So if the patient comes in with acute chest pain or has a, a recent episode, one would worry about an MI, and then that's going to be a segmental uh, abnormality, in this case in the antero, anterior septum essentially. If we look at the perfusion image, which is next, then um, we can see there's a defect in the anterior myocardium here, it's subendocardial. Classically, MI is gonna predominate subendocardial, perhaps will eventually become uh, uh, transmural. And then if we look at the delayed image right over here, we can appreciate an area of gadolinium retention. This is a 10 minute delay in a subendocardial uh, region in the same location. This segmental subendocardial predominant appearance is gonna be something that gives us a clue that this is in fact an ischemic event. So this is a segmental subendocardial uh, myocardial infarction. Now if the patient has chest pain, often a younger patient, but it doesn't fall into that uh, category and it's patch here in mid myocardial, this is a delayed image as well, then you would tend to think of myocarditis. And so the, the symptoms mimic an MI. The, this is a, a very good technique, uh, better than pretty much any other technique to make your diagnosis of myocarditis. So it's non-segmental. If the patient, on the other hand, has non-acute chest pain and a non-ischemic appearance, then you're gonna think of something generally that's infiltrative. And two of the most common ones as shown here are sarcoidosis and amyloidosis. And let's talk in the last minute or two about pericardial disease, and that can be done with CT and or, uh, or MRI, or perhaps both sometimes, and we can see quite a lot of things. So I will show you an example of a simple effusion. You can put Hounsfield units on this, and you will get a number in the zero to 20 Hounsfield range. Uh, just a reconstructed image uh, in a sagittal view showing a large pericardial effusion. On the other hand, looking at this image, it's clear this is not going to be a low uh, density type of pericardial fusion. It's very, it's variegated, it's high density. Um, on the coronal view, you can see it's, it's circumferential as well, and that was pericardial hemorrhage. Pericardial calcification, similar to what I showed a moment ago on the plain film, uh, will be something that you'll often see on the right side of the heart in addition to the left, often related to the AV grooves. And again, think of the possibility of constrictive pericarditis in that case. And in fact, uh, you can do an MRI and look for flattening of the septum, which suggests ventricular interdependence and the presence of constrictive pericarditis or cons pericardial constriction at the very least. And this is just another example showing that, um, and I believe this is the same thing, but just showing spade-like ventricles 
uh, flattening. So uh, these are some of the findings that you're going to look for for uh, pericardial constrictive pericarditis or pericardial constriction. Pericardial cyst, classically, uh, it's going to have a low, sometimes people call this a spring water cyst, very low uh, density on CT, 0 to 20 Hounsfield units. On MRI, a T2 weighted image here, it's going to be light bulb bright, and that's a classic look for a pericardial cyst. And finally, pericardial malignancy, it's, it's going to be very, uh, very irregular, very soft tissue density, somewhat nodular as in this case. In this case, this was a pericardial a thymoma from the mediastinum that had spread into the pericardium. So let me just conclude by mentioning a couple of points, and that is that the uh, CT is going to have advantages with better spatial resolution, easier for clinicians and surgeons to recognize, faster, less claustrophobia. MRI, on the other hand, has no radiation, no iodinated contrast, in fact, may need no contrast, depending on what you do, and a lot of sequence variability or versatility. And so with that, thank you very much.